Welcome to the general chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 11 to 15. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 11, it says flame atomic absorption spectroscopy is a technique used to convert free atoms into their gaseous state and measure the absorption of light. This technique follows the Beer-Lambert law, meaning it is most useful for which of the following. So we are using something which is dependent on the Beer-Lambert law and we want to know what it's useful for. So the Beer-Lambert law looks like this. And yeah, so absorption is equal to the molar absorption constant times the length of whatever your sample is in, so the cuvette, times the concentration. So the things that the Beer-Lambert law is really good at is relating some absorption to a concentration. So if we have a known standard of some, some material, whatever we want to look at, some molecule, and we know that at a certain concentration it absorbs at this, this intensity, then we can look at an unknown sample and look at its absorption at a certain wavelength and then determine the concentration we have in the unknown sample. So th those are the things that it's most useful for. And in any undergrad course that you use with the Beer-Lambert law, you're most likely going to be looking for concentration. So option A is saying that it's useful for determining the identity of an unknown element in a sample. It could be used for that, but it's not the thing that it's most useful for. Usually, what you're doing is you already have a standard and you set up some curve so you know at different concentrations the absorption of that specific element is at a certain intensity for the absorption at a certain concentration it's this much absorbance and then you can detect if your sample has that certain element or not but you need a standard first you can't just look at the spectroscopy that output and then from that immediately determine what the element is in your unknown solution without having some sort of standard or reference first. Option B is saying determining the concentration of a solution. Yes, this is correct. This is what it's most useful for. Option C is saying identifying the decomposition rate of the element in the solution. No, that doesn't really make sense. Once again, it's a type of experiment you might be able to do if something is going away in solution over time. But usually if we do some type of reaction like that, then it's like if we have a substrate and then we also have some enzyme present and the enzyme is converting it. So there's some reaction taking place, which is why the, the substrate is disappearing in concentration over time. But usually things don't just decompose, especially if we're talking about an element. Elements do not de decompose just like that in a solution. That doesn't really make sense. And option D is saying finding the relative solubility of the atom in different solutions. So this is talking about relative solubility and that's not really something we do. We don't like change the, so the solvent and see the solubility of something in different solvents. That's not really something we do with spectroscopy. We keep the solvent the same and what we're changing is usually the concentration. So that's not something we do with the Beer-Lambert law. So D is incorrect. In question 12, we're asked which of the following describes the energy conversion process involved in a person walking. So we want to know energy conversion of a person walking. So for someone to walk, they need to move their muscles. For the muscles to have energy to move, that energy source comes from ATP. So ATP is the, elect the energy currency of the cell, and it's, it's kind of a stored form of energy. Our cells have a certain amount of ATP stored up, which has the potential for the bonds in ATP to be broken and release energy. And then from that, the muscles can use that energy released to, to contract, and then we can get a person to walk. So first of all, you have chemical energy in the form of ATP that is turned into kinetic energy when we get movement of muscles, and finally heat is what comes last. So option D is correct. Heat comes at the end, which comes from friction as your muscles and joints move. 
there's air resistance as well. There's a sound that your footsteps make as you walk. So all of that comes last after first you convert the chemical energy into some kinetic energy. So D is our correct energy conversion process here. In question 13, it says condensation of water in the atmosphere requires a nucleation point for clouds. Which of the following substances functions as a, mo a most effective nucleation point? So condensation, meaning the formation of clouds, needs some nucleation point. What's the most effective type of nucleation point? So something on which water droplets can kind of begin to clump around and then form bigger, bigger kind of molecules or a bigger structure, meaning clouds in this case. And this also applies for any crystals that are forming in a solution as well. You need something for this entire structure to kind of latch onto at the beginning before it can form. So this usually requires some type of small solid particle that is present in the atmosphere. So we can remove any type of gas. It doesn't really make sense that in ozone or some type of nitric oxide that you can have water kind of condensing and collecting on a gas. That doesn't really work. Water is a liquid for it to kind of collect on a gas doesn't make sense. It's going to be collecting on a solid. And then we can remove sand because we don't really find sand floating around in the atmosphere. Sand is going to be on the ground. It's way too large a particle for it to just be floating around in the atmosphere. But dust, dust can be a much smaller particle. And yes, we do have a lot of dust in the atmosphere. It's so small that we can't even see it with the human eye because that's how tiny it is. And we have a lot of it floating around. So yeah, there's dust everywhere. And dust is usually what water uses as a nucleation point for forming clouds. In question 14, it states in the following reaction, dino chloride or SOCl2 is a blank. So we are talking about this molecule over here. And as you can see, since it's on top of the arrow, that means that it is something that the thing to the left of the arrow is reacting with. So we had a carboxylic acid, it reacted with this reagent on top of the arrow, and then we got some reaction. So the carboxylic acid was converted into an acyl chloride, and then we have some byproducts. You don't see thionyl chloride on the right side of the arrow, which means that it is not a product, and then it's not a catalyst either. Because for it to be a catalyst, that would mean that it would show up on both the reactant and the product side, and it would not be used up, but you see that it is used up because it's converted into something else. You see that one of its chlorides ended up on the carboxylic acid, and then the rest of it became SO2, and then the other chloride went with HCl. So that molecule does not remain at the end as it was in the beginning, therefore it's not a catalyst, but we can say it's a reactant because it's something which react with another molecule at the beginning of the reaction to give us some new products. In question 15, we're asked which of the following elements lives within the D block of the periodic table. So in the periodic table, these uh, first two rows or first two columns, the first two groups are the S blocks over here. These guys are the P blocks, and then these guys over here are the D blocks. And our options are lithium, chromium, selenium, and aluminium. Lithium is over here, so it's in the S block. Aluminium is over here in the P block. Selenium also in the P block, and then the only thing in the D block is chromium which is over here in the transition metals so think d block think the transition metals and chromium is the only one of the options given which is transition metal so b is our correct answer that's it for the questions in this video if you enjoyed what you saw make sure to check out our course the link is in the description below and in that course we go through a lot more questions just like in this video going through all the different answer options and explaining why each one is correct or incorrect other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.